Welcome to the Sagan Exoplanet Summer Workshop. Welcome to Caltech. You're going to have an excellent week. My name is Gary Blackwood. I'm the manager of NASA's Exoplanet Exploration Program. I work at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. JPL is part of Caltech, but we're not located here. Let me show you where it is. Here's a map of Pasadena. Here you are. JPL is located seven miles away in what used to be the near wilderness where students and scientists from Caltech first experimented with rocket engines. JPL is uh, known for, among other things, designing the first U.S. satellite, Explorer 1, which was launched in 1958. More recently, JPL is known for very exciting and dramatic landings on Mars and, and rovers that, uh, that travel the surface of the planet. But perhaps for me, the most significant accomplishment, or one of the most significant accomplishments of JPL, uh, was made by the Voyager spacecraft. The Voyagers were launched in 1977 to explore the outer solar system. And in 1990, back before the age of exoplanets, NASA and JPL at the urging of Carl Sagan, turned the Voyager spacecraft around and took an image of the Earth from about two billion miles away, producing the image that we all know now as the pale blue dot. Now back in 1990, this image was both um, beautiful and somewhat haunting because the Earth looked alone in the universe. But here we are, 25 years later, and we now know that the Earth is not alone in the universe. We know of thousands of exoplanets, and by inference, many more, perhaps as many as one for every star in the Milky Way galaxy. And uh, how does the, on, on these exoplanets, how does the Earth look? The Earth looks like another exoplanet. Of course, to us, um, the Earth means everything. Here's the, an arc of missions that NASA has launched or is planning that accomplish exoplanet science. We call this the arc of exoplanet missions. Now, some of these missions were designed and launched before there were exoplanets, and, uh, such as Hubble and Spitzer. And yet, engineers and scientists have figured out a way to uh, um, uh, uh, adjust these, uh, the operations of these instruments to be able to do exoplanet science. Almost everybody in the room is familiar with the Kepler spacecraft and the huge yield of exoplanets that Kepler has produced. We look forward to the launch of the TESS and James Webb telescopes in the next three years. We look forward to beginning the formulation of the w first AFTA telescope, which would launch in 2024, which will, among other things, perform an exoplanet census and the first direct imaging of our exoplanet nearest neighbors using a coronagraph. And then beyond that, as we enter uh, an, a decadal prioritization process called the, uh, <coughs> the, uh, the decadal survey in 2020, we are imagining future exoplanet missions uh, under the category of New World's Telescope that might include the exoplanet missions called the Habitable Exoplanet Imager or the Large UV Optical Infrared, Louvoir Telescope. These are different concepts that would perform the first direct detection uh, of, uh, and spectroscopy for biosignature gases in Earth-sized planets in the habitable zones of their host stars. The arc becomes even more compelling when you include the missions that are planned and, uh, and in operation from our ESA and European colleagues. Let's talk a little bit about the program. So the 2014 NASA Science Plan describes three purposes for the program. I like to think that I've only got three things to do when I go to work each day. Discover exoplanets, characterize them, and search for planets with habitability. I like to think of this as the search for life in our galaxy. Here's an overview of the program. What are the pieces of this? Well, we have space missions and mission studies, Kepler and K2. Now Kepler is 
Uh, now it's down to two of its four reaction wheels, but no worries, the engineers at Ball Aerospace, one of whom's in the audience today, <laughs> there's Scott, have figured out a way to point the spacecraft using only two reaction wheels using solar uh, pressure off of the roof line of the solar arrays. The w first AFTA mission, which I mentioned, we also look at new concepts uh, using coronagraphs and star shades for uh, this advanced high contrast imaging. In the program, we also perform ground-based science for important and essential precursor science and follow-up science. Precursor, like the Large Binocular Telescope Interferometer, this is managed by the University of Arizona uh, on Mount Graham. This is to explore and characterize the dust surrounding sun-like stars. That's an important parameter in the design of these future missions. Uh, the program through Nexi manages NASA's one-sixth time on the Keck Large Telescopes on Mauna Kea. This, many, much of that time is used for follow-up to promising Kepler targets. And also, most recently, a NASA-NSF partnership for precision radial velocity on Kitt Peak will commission an instrument for advanced precision radial velocity in the 2018-2019 timeframe. The program also includes technology development to go to that next level. We talked about w first AFTA, the direct detection of our nearest neighbors. We need to keep pushing the technology to the level of one part in 10 to the 9 or 10 to the 10 uh, in high contrast imaging using coronagraph masks or star shade technology. We also, the program also contains the NASA Exoplanet Science Institute, which includes professional engagement many of the archives for the exoplanets, as well as this very important Sagan Summer Workshop. And then finally, we include a public engagement, which includes eyes and exoplanets of visual visualization. And how could I not mention the exoplanet travel posters that some of you may have seen on the internet. Kepler really changed everything. The, uh, this graphic shows the exoplanet gold rush. This was produced by Hugh Osborne, who's a PhD student at the University of Warwick. And he imagined the gold rush, the yield, the harvest that came from the Kepler spacecraft. And so he plotted here in period of years and uh, on the x-axis and mass on the y-axis. And you can see the Earth there in the middle, one year, one Earth mass. He's plotted the other planets in our solar system. There's Jupiter a little further out. And back in 1750, there were only six endoplanets that we knew about. And so let's get this, uh, let's find, there we, there we go. You'll see the year advance, and you'll also see the number of planets increase. So there's Uranus. Now what comes next? Not Neptune. Ceres was considered a planet for a while. <clears throat> and then... Uh, Neptune will kick in shortly. We all know what's next, right? What decade will we see Pluto? 1930s, okay. And then we lose it again, 2006, okay. So after Pluto, a long time before we found any more planets. And so astronomers were searching with radial velocity. And it wasn't until 1995 that the first universally accepted exoplanet was discovered, 51 peg. And then a whole raft followed using the, uh, the radial velocity technique in blue. And then other techniques were in developed, including the transit method. And in 2009, the Kepler spacecraft was launched, and then the exoplanet gold rush began. And so look at the plethora of green dots that start in 2009 coming from the Kepler space spacecraft. Truly um, a great visual depiction of the exoplanet gold rush. Now the Kepler spacecraft, as prolific as it was and is, still only explored a tiny fraction of the galaxy. Here's a depiction of the planets within our galaxy that Kepler has discovered using the transit method, looking down an arm of the Milky Way galaxy, the Orion Spur. You see that population looking towards the galactic bulge? Does anyone know what the detection technique was for those? Microlensing, exactly, very good. And so microlensing is the technique that will be used on the w First spacecraft to extend the uh, census that was begun by Kepler. 
WFIRST will stare at a patch of the Milky Way towards the central bulge between Sagittarius and Scorpio, and by looking at the brightening of the background stars due to the gravitational lensing effect of a foreground star that passes along that line of sight between us and the background star. And that brightening will have a modulation if the foreground star has a planet around it. And by means of that, Kepler will complete the census. Kepler, I mean, w first will complete the census begun by Kepler. W, Kepler was sensitive to planets that were about 400 uh, uh, <coughs> day period inward, and microlensing is most sensitive to those um, planets that are further out beyond, beyond that orbit, beyond the ice line. The W first spacecraft will also perform exoplanet direct imaging using a high contrast imaging uh, uh, coronagraph. And using that coronagraph, the telescope will block out the central light of the star and expose the exoplanets that are orbiting and perform spectroscopy on a few dozen of our exoplanet nearest neighbors, gas and ice giants, maybe some super Earths if they're there, and we think they are. But that technology, that technique requires a technology called high contrast imaging. And we need to deal with the glare of the star. We have to suppress the diffraction of the star to about one part in 10 to the nine or one part in 10 to the 10. And we do that using coronagraph masks. Those masks are in the pupil plane or in the uh, focal plane of the telescope. And they perform uh, a rejection of the scattered light. They throw the light to the outside of the field of view. The analogy is dropping a pebble into a pond and all the ripples appear only at the edges of the pond, leaving a quiet central part of the pond. A couple more minutes? Sure. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I was watching the clock, it said nine. So <clears throat> I'll mention that we have uh, other uh, technologies for starshade, high contrast imaging, and here's a depiction of a starshade concept flying uh, launched together out to a uh, L2 or to a uh, earth trailing or earth leading point where the star shade would deploy and these specially shaped petals also diffract the light but this mask instead of being inside the telescope is outside and flies about 30,000 or 50,000 kilometers away from the telescope creating a shadow that's only a couple of meters wide that the telescope flies in flying in that shadow this, the exoplanets are revealed so, now it will be a long time before we reach any of these exoplanets, but that hasn't stopped our JPL artists from considering what travel to these planets would look like. So we've produced some tr travel posters in the program. Uh, what would uh, travel to a super Earth be like, experiencing that gravity? How about Kepler 186f, an Earth-sized planet orbiting an M star? Perhaps the grass is redder on the other side. And uh, my favorite, Kepler 16b, a planet orbiting two suns, uh, where your shadow really does always have company. So I'll, I'll end with by mentioning our next travel poster releases August 3rd. So it's a good one. <laughs> so I'll end with this slide and ask you to imagine the future. And I look around the room and I will say to you that I'm envious of you. Many of you are early in your career, you're in, in college, you're in graduate school, maybe you're about to enter college. And, and I'm envious of you because of the career that you have in front of you. What an exciting time. Because in the next 10 to 20 years, 12 to 20 years, uh, we will have on orbit missions capable of performing detection of biosignature gases on terrestrial planets in the habitable zones of their stars. And when those missions are on orbit, there will be a mission control room. And in that mission control room will be scientists and engineers who will be the first humans in the history of mankind to see evidence of life on an exoplanet. And I invite you to look around the room and believe that the future members of that team some of whom are in the room right now. And then I ask you to not only believe it's true, I ask you to know it's true, because the person is you. You're the person who's on the mission team. You're the person who earned your degree, became a member of the, uh, of the science team, 
who are in mission control. And you know that it's true because of what you do over the next 10 years. And it's what you do next year when you get back to school. And it's what you do next week when you return home from this very excellent Sagan Summer Workshop. Have a great week, and thank you for your time. Sure, the question is, what is the status of getting a coronagraph onto the W-1st mission? Here's the great news. It's a baseline part of the mission now to have a chronograph on the W-1st mission. The mission is going through um, a pre-formulation phase, and it's the plan of NASA to have it within the next year enter what we call phase A, the formulation phase, with the chronograph as a baseline uh, part of the mission, both a technology demonstration, first of a kind, that also happens to do you know, first-of-a-kind groundbreaking science.